Meeting is being recorded. <clears throat> All right. So what I was hoping to do, and I'm going to now share my screen. So this is basically the homework assignment uh, that we were working on for this week. Again, the file is available on Elms. Uh, you were asked to convert the financial statements into TFI, TII, CFI, and economic profit. Um, in the interest of time, we we'll probably spend more of our time on CFI, but basically what you did or should have done in the assignment, I'll start out with TFI as a solution, make it a little bit bigger, is essentially <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the TFI is the reconverted balance sheet. And what we have is now four sections. The first section, which is operating, the operating assets net of the operating liabilities is called invested capital. Now in my solution, I broke things into shorter term working capital and longer term uh, capital items to get invested capital. For, for, but for purposes of your conversion, you didn't have to do that. If, if you just got the right invested capital, I'm good with that for this first homework assignment. Now going forward, when we start doing the valuation, Part of the reason why I broke out working capital and longer term capital liabilities separately is that we are going to be forecasting working capital to grow at a different rate than long term capital. So it's, it's really the setup for the valuation. But in terms of the conversion, try to get to invested capital. Uh, then you would have your non operating assets and liabilities, which you would add together to get your to total funds available to total funds invested. And then that would equal the debt and equity firm. <laughs> So I'm just going to pause because hopefully this one shouldn't have been the most difficult of the statements. I think the CFI was. So I'll just pause here to see if there were any questions about the TFI. I had a quick question, Professor. Sure. So obviously, well, I'm, I'm not sure about anyone else, but my biggest problem was the CFI. and. Yeah, but, we're going to get to that one next. I just want yeah, to start with TFI first. Right, but so for the TFI, just as far as some of the other stuff going on there, would it have made a difference, though, you know, setting it up the way you did uh, with kind of net PP&E and going into the longer term, uh, putting that a little further? So, Because in mine, I, you know, personally, I didn't have operating working capital. I had, you know, just kind of summed up some of the other things. It should, it should um, not have made a difference in your CFI. Okay. In your CFI. And, we'll, and I'll show you what I call the shortcut, which I think I mentioned in the video, to doing the CFI when we get there, okay? But no, it would not have made a difference. As I said, this is really more for thinking ahead to help us with the converted statement for the company. But, but basically, conceptually, what you're looking at, and again, this is a hypothetical company, but what we're really saying is this company has invested, I used billions in 2012, $4 billion of investments. You know, basically of that, 3550 is operating, and then the rest is non-operating investment. And the 4090 is financed this way through debt and equity. That's kind of the way the statement is being set up, slightly different perspective than a balance sheet, which then leads to the income statement. And again, you could have done the TII before the TFI because you could do the income statement <coughs> or balance sheet independent of each other. It doesn't matter which of those two statements you convert first. Okay, what's going to matter is you have to do both to get the cash flow. So TII, same concept. Um, the operating income statement conversion gets you to what we call no plat or no pat. Kinsey calls it no plat. The rest of the world calls it no pat. Then we have the non-operating profits. Add them together, you get your total income available to investors. And then how is the income distributed? That's the financing side to the debt and net income, which is the equity distribution. So again, slightly different format for the statement, but the idea is, again, I use 2012 as a metaphor. This company generated 133, we'll call it million of after-tax profit. It then generated an additional 28 million of non-operating profit, added them together, had 161 million of total income available to distribute to investors. And then the question is, how did it distribute the 161? And so again, distributions become positive numbers in this statement. 
So I have 161 to distribute. The two sides have to balance. How did I distribute the 161? So payouts become positive numbers. I distributed 80, or sorry, net of interest tax yield. I distributed 56 to interest. I distributed 22 in dividend to the minority shareholders and 83 to my common shareholders. You add those three together, you basically get the 161. And that's, that's the format of the TII. So again, just quick questions about TII. All right, CFI. This is the one, I know I talked to several of you, received some emails from several of you. This statement is a little bit more of a challenge. <clears throat> the important thing about this statement is to understand this is not FASB, this is not GAAP, right? These, these are economic statements tied to Bendigliani Miller. So the key here is it's about cash flow. And cash flow is basically from the financial statements, the cash generated from the income statement minus the investment in the balance sheet. And the balance sheets are static statements, it's the change in the balance sheet. So income minus change in the balance sheet equals cash flow. And that's a process that you were repeating four times for each of the four sections on this statement. So the first one was the concept of free cash flow. Again, free cash flow is cash from the income statement, the gross cash flow, minus cash reinvested in the balance sheet, the gross investment, okay? So again, I'll use 2011. Gross cash flow is the no plat, which you calculated, adding back depreciation, that's your gross cash flow. That's the cash coming from the income statement. Then, investment in the balance sheet. This is the more granular way of getting to it, but the simple method that I mentioned in the video as well is basically, think about it this way, it's the change in the invested capital. So 2011 invested capital minus 2010 invested capital plus depreciation for the current year should give you your gross investment. So to your question that you had asked me a few minutes ago of did I need to do the granularity? No, you could have calculated the gross investment by using sort of the macro method, the simplistic method, and you would have gotten the same answer. Matter of fact, same for 2012, okay? And, and so basically, that's what's happening, right? And if you wonder why we're adding back depreciation, it's just math. Because what's happening here is you get the change in invested capital, but one of the changes in invested capital is you have investments in working capital, investments in PP&E, which are called CapEx, and eventually investments in other companies, goodwill. Those are the three types of investments that companies generally make. So here's the key. If I add them all up, the one thing that's weird is CapEx. And so let's just talk about what is CapEx. CapEx simply, capital expenditures, equals, the way we could actually look at it is if I took my ending PP&E, Start it this way. I start my starting PPD, property, plant, equipment, and I added my capital expenditures, and then I subtracted any depreciation I had for the year, I get my ending PPE balance. That's just kind of mechanically how you get from one balance sheet to the other with property, plant, and equipment. So all I did here for CapEx is solve for CapEx, and if I solve for CapEx, then basically what I get equals my NPP&E minus my beginning PP&E plus my depreciation. That's just the rearranged equation. And so the reason why it's changing invested capital plus depreciation is because of right here. This plus depreciation, when you net the invested capitals, is the one thing that gets added, and that's the shortcut. But the point of the story is, 2011, the company generated 381 of cash from the income statement, essentially disinvested by the, from the balance sheet 178, and generated, therefore, free cash flow from operations of 559. And the reason it disinvested is because it freed up 43 million of working capital, only spent 20 on CapEx, 
only spent 50 on goodwill and it increased its liabilities by 300. So essentially this company funded these investments by not paying suppliers. And as a result of that, it had disinvestment last year of cash flow. That's kind of what you're setting up mechanically when you went through that statement. Again, I'm going to pause here for any questions. So when we're looking at the positive numbers in this portion, that's money being pushed out or that's cash flow being pushed out. Meanwhile, the other like long-term liabilities and stuff like that, that's like those liabilities increasing as the effect of that outflow of cash flow. Is that what we're saying? Exactly. With one caveat, um, I, I would just use the word potentially able to be pushed out as opposed to actually pushed out. So that's the whole point of the second half of the statement below the line of CFI is below the line of CFI is what's actually being pushed out or distributed, right? Above the CFI is what's capable of being pushed out or distributed. So the whole point is I made 381 of cash running my business. <clears throat> I didn't really put much back into it and I funded it by basically having a bunch of IOUs to my vendors. So theoretically this period, I could pay 559. Now, eventually I'm going to have to pay these vendors, but technically this period I have 559 available to be distributed. Now changes to 2012 because in 2012 I made 393, but I spent a whole bunch of CapEx. And so therefore, <clears throat> um, I actually had negative free cash flow because I spent, and I'm, I'm kind of ignoring these other items, but basically I spent primarily more than I took in. So I have to find this amount of money. And that's actually going to be a very important distinction because in just a minute, when we talk about how to analyze these statements. That's exactly where we start. Because what I'll tell you is you start with free cash flow. Because basically, if a company has a positive free cash flow, then you know the money is going to be going somewhere. So the whole point is, where did it go? If a company has negative free cash flow, then the company needs cash. Where did it come from? So that number is very telling because it will set up how we will eventually do the analysis. But again, non-operating cash flows. Here, we got 559 from operations. Well, again, made 21 of income from interest ex interest income we made another eight four of after tax non operating income and then we had these balance sheet changes i don't have a good way of talking about the pluses and minuses on the balance sheet and without just saying you have to kind of think through the implications of the cash and think about what you're trying to get to on this statement the whole point of cfi is this is the cash available to pay out to my investors so as you think about the balance sheet changes the question is does this add or take away from the cash that I can distribute? So for example, if I, and the metaphor I like to think of is if I take money from my checking account and I throw it to my savings account, I have less money to pay bills. So when I increase my excess cash, I'm decreasing my CFI, my money to pay my investors. And that's what's happening when the excess cash balance goes up. Okay. So basically sending money to Fidelity, right? Same thing. When I buy stakes in other companies, I'm reducing my CFI. So it's a negative impact to my CFI, right? If I don't pay my suppliers, I increase what I owe them, then that adds to my CFI. If I pay off my suppliers, reduce my accounts payable, that reduces the cash that I have available to eventually pay to the rest of the debt and the equity holders. So this is really just thinking about the directionality of the cash flow. But the point is, is this cash adding or taking away from the cash I have distributed. And that's the point. Here I had 213 to distribute. How did I distribute it? So just like on TII, distributions are positive numbers because I want these statements to balance. And this is what gets confusing because you're thinking about the statement of cash flow you learn in accounting. And that's not what this is. This statement says, I have 213 to distribute. How did I distribute? Well, I had to give 43 to my interest. So of my 213, 43 paid my interest. Okay. 25 paid my minority shareholders a dividend, 20 paid my preferred shareholders a dividend, 40 paid my common shareholders a dividend. And I increased my debt okay, to do so because I bought back treasury stock. And you can kind of think about this mechanically because 
how do I buy back $245 million worth of stock if I only have $213 million worth of profit from running my business? And the answer is I needed to find it somewhere. And so in this case, the company found it through its debt. So again, on this side of the statement, outflows are positive, inflows are negative. And what's a challenge about this class that nobody else makes you do, I know it sounds like a pain in the ass, but it actually helps you, is people stop here. In the real world, people stop here. And I just want to keep tracking it because it's insightful to see what companies did with their cash. But that becomes the key to the CFI. Again, I'm going to pause because I know you struggle with this statement. Questions? The good news is that you won't have to convert statements in the shortened semesters again. In the valuation you're doing for Starbucks next week, where you'll see these statements, I've done the conversions for you. Right? The reason I'm making you convert the statements, now, and if this were a semester-long class, you'd keep converting. But basically, I need you to understand how these work so you can do the anal analysis. So again, other questions? I guess one of my main questions is, is uh, how do you know which items to do a change from as compared to, you know, you just use the value itself? Income statement items, you use the value, balance sheets about the change. And it just goes to the nature of the statement. Since balance sheets are snapshot statements, it's not a flow. It's called a stock and a flow. So it's, it's a stock, it's, it's a static item. So because a balance sheet's a static item, the way that I think about cash flow, it's the change between the two static items. Where income statement is a period of activity over time, it's a flow. So income statement items are the actual cash flows. Balance sheet items are the change between the two. Because if you think about it, balance sheet, income statement, we create your next balance sheet. Because the income statement explains the changes between two balance sheets. Okay. That's, that's kind of the way to think about this. Uh, I'm sorry, question. Go ahead. Yeah, so um, for my CFI, I got the 213.4 the and the negative 227 for the top half. Great. But then as I was going through trying to balance it for the bottom, how come you didn't take the difference of like the interest, the dividends? It's just like the actual numbers from the financial well, statements. It goes back to these are the actual flows, meaning – the, the interest expense is the actual payment to the bondholders. The dividend is the actual payment to a common shareholder, a minority shareholder, or a preferred shareholder. Whereas common stock or preferred stock or debt, that goes back to the balance sheet. So I had a, think about a credit card statement. I have a credit card bill that has a $2,000 balance. Next month, I have a credit card bill that has a $3,000 balance. Well, what we know, if I just saw those two things, is you spent $1,000 that month. And so that's what you're solving for in CFI. Okay? Now, if I make a payment of $500 against my credit card, that payment of $500 is like the interest expense. I'm not paying the whole thing off, so I'm just sending $500 to Bank of America or Capital One. So that's basically what we're doing here at the corporate level. So interest expense and dividends are the actual flows the debt and the equity, we look at the changes to see whether or not cash is being generated or cash is being used, sources and uses, by the change in the debt and the equity. That's what okay. this is. Okay. Yeah, so that's where, that's where my, my, my difference was, was I'm, I'm taking the actual differences of those kind of three rows right there versus using the actual figures, so that makes sense though. Yeah, and, and again, just it's confusing to get started, but that's CFI. And then economic profit, just very quickly, the fourth tab, is just a, this is also called economic value added. It's created by Stern Stewart. And it's just basically saying, in one period of time, is a company generating a positive NPV? Theoretically, if you did this over time, it is NPV. Like, ROIC is like IRR. Whack is your R. So when you have a positive spread, you generate NPV. When you have zero spread, you don't generate any NPV. Well, economic profit is one period NPV. So therefore, if you have zero spread, you have zero economic profit. So economic profit is just a way of saying two things. Number one, if it's negative, that means you didn't generate a positive spread. And so it tells you how many dollars from that zero spread you are. So in 2011, the, the company had a 9% whack 
had a 4.7% ROIC. So basically what it says is they were 150.4 short of 9%. That's what negative 150.4 really represents. Just a one period change in value. It's a little bit dangerous as a metric because it is short term, meaning we don't know if these investments that they're making now will pay off later or not. That's not part of EVA or economic profit. So it does lead to some short termism. But regardless, it is a, a quick snapshot to say, is this company today creating value based on the cash they want? Because from an investor standpoint, I gave you 3550. I expect you to make nine per, or sorry, this is reason the beginning of year. I gave you 3062. I expect you to make 9% on that. So you got to make <clears throat> essentially 275 to keep me happy. You only made 133, so you're 143 short. I'm rounding off here. But that's, that's basically just a very simplistic way to judge you. Okay? And, and I'll give you another way. <clears throat> so, for example, this is Bloomberg, and this is Anheuser-Busch InBev. And what I want to show you <clears throat> is this is forward looking, but I'll show you how EVA could be used in the real world by analysts. So, can you see the screen? Can you guys see the screen? Not Bloomberg if you're on there. I'm on Bloomberg. You can't see Bloomberg? We still see the Excel. All right. Can you see Bloomberg now? Yep. This is a screen which you're going to be familiar with next week called the earnings estimates. It's a real time view of the consensus estimates from Wall Street for any company. And this is for Anheuser Busch InBev in real time. They're the big beer maker, Budweiser, other people. <clears throat> so this is what they did. This column right here, 2018, where my mouse is, is what they did last year. And this is what they're expected to do in 19, 20, 21, 22, for example, revenue. And I'll use pre-tax profit EBITDA. These are profit forecasts for 800 bush the next four years. So what I want to go back to, I'll go back a couple periods, but what ended up happening is Anheuser-Busch a couple of years ago in 2015 and 2016 basically spent a hundred billion dollars to buy a company in 2016 called SAB Miller. So they wanted to become the biggest company in the world. They spent $100 billion to buy SAB Miller. Okay, so let's just say, from a cost of capital standpoint, the market wants them to make 10% a year. So you go spend $100 billion, I need you to make 10% a year. What's 10% of 100 billion? Starting it easy. Working you guys into this. What's 10% of 100 billion? 10 billion. There we go. So I need to see 10 <clears throat> billion of after tax profit improvement per year to justify this acquisition. That's economic profit. That's my capital charge. That's not even the capital they have. That's just on the acquisition. So how much profit did they have in 2015? Pre tax. It's almost thirteen billion dollars. What's that saying over the sound of dishes? Sorry, whoever's doing dishes, can you mute yourself, please? <laughs> please, thank you. So, basically, they were making close to thirteen billion of pre-tax profit before the acquisition. Add the two companies together, you have hundred billion dollars worth of debt, total capital to buy this company. Take ten percent of that after tax, and this is pre-tax. You got to make. 10 billion more after tax, which is probably more like 13 billion more pre tax. This number needs to get to like 25 billion if you're going to justify that acquisition. Well, this is what happened. Here we are in 2018. They're making less this year than before they bought the company. They got $100 billion more debt. And oh, by the way, we'll give them a couple of years of credit. But what about the next few years? By 2021. They're going to make pre-tax profit of twenty billion. So, in in a best case scenario, they make relative to where they started seven eight billion more, and they should have made ten billion a year plus 
actually after tax, we should make 13 billion a year for the last five or six years going into this raising. So long story short, that's negative economic profit. And oh, by the way, this is the share price for the last five years. And this is when they bought Anheuser-Busch in Bethel. Straight line down. So I'm just saying, rule of thumb with the analyst. This is how the analysts actually use this information in the real world. Because if I know how much capital you have, and I know a cost of capital, I can kind of judge what the profit level should be. And maybe you're making some investments to pay off later, so great, you spend $100 billion, let me see the synergies from the acquisition, they haven't materialized, that's why you see such terrible headlines right now for anheuser -Busch. you got a lot of unhappy investors who are not kept. I'm getting more advanced, but that's basically what comes once we do the analysis. So before I go forward, questions about CFI or EP? Uh, Professor, I, I know you probably went over this. Do you mind going to CFI and going on the, the bottom portion? Uh, when you're checking your your CFI numbers, I'm getting confused with you know getting a, a negative change and then changing the sign again. Can you maybe go over like a something we just ask ourselves to to decide whether we're adding or subtracting? All right, I'm going to go back. To you. Can you see the statement? Okay, so here's the way I want you to think about this. I want you to just focus on column C and column D. Okay. And I want you to look at short-term debt. What happened here? Just, just verbally tell me what happened here. Rotate goes down. By how much? 40 how million. Much? 40 million. So we know this company paid 40 million of short-term debt off. Is that cash going out? Or cash coming into the firm should be going out is a cash distribution on the CFI a positive number or a negative number if I have CFI I pay it out if I don't if I'm missing CFI I need to borrow it so it's is a payout of 40 million short-term debt a positive or negative number and somebody can help Positive. Okay, let's go down to the next line item. What happened to long-term debt? Went up to 400. Was that an inflow or an outflow? It's like an outflow. Right. If I borrow 400 million, because I'm basically borrowing 400 million more, is that an inflow or an outflow of the firm? Outflow, because you have less cash. No, it's the other way around. If your credit card balance goes up between two statements, you're spending money. You're taking money from the credit card company. So when your debt goes up, that's an inflow of cash. You're actually borrowing money from the bank, borrowing money from the bondholders. So therefore, it's a negative on your CFI. So, so the point of the story is, it, there's no simplistic algorithmic mathematical model because you don't know whether I'm going to give you the debt as a, as a negative or a positive number on the statement. It doesn't really matter. You just have to look at the statements, ask yourself, what's the direction of the cash? And then you put the sign in the sign. That's the easiest way to do it, in the, practically in the real world. Okay? So when we do statements, that's the way we're looking at it. Matter of fact, when we practice the analytics in a minute, it's gonna come out very similar when you start analyzing this. A bit more used to this as you see it in this format. But that's the short answer, is you literally just kind of go through each line and just say, okay, next one. Let's go to TII. I am distributing, or even the income statement, I am distributing minority, I'm paying $22 my minority shareholders. And I can see that because it reduced my income. Well, if I'm distributing $22 to my minority shareholders, that's a positive on my CFI. It's a $22 outflow. And so it's just, it's literally just kind of thinking through line by line. That, that's the, the sim most simplistic way I can give you about thinking about these statements. Yeah, thank you. 
Hey, Professor. By the way, if, if somebody is uh, washing dishes, please mute yourself. Moving furniture, whatever you're doing. Moving please. furniture. <laughs> Lots of stuff happening, and it sounds like a kitchen. Hey, Professor, I have a question on uh, minority interest. Yes. So uh, this is what threw me off, and I'm looking at it, and that, that, that's where my numbers don't match up. So we use minority interest from, it looks like, the income statement and not the balance sheet. Why is that? You actually use from both. Okay. So, uh, and it's just, unfortunately, we have to deal with real-world accounting. So the short-term answer, and I'll go back here, is that what minority interest comes from it is, and unfortunately, this is beyond the scope of this class, but... But the short answer is what minority interest is coming from is it's coming from I own a piece of another business. So, for example, General Motors bought part of Lyft. General Motors is going to make a lot of money when Lyft does its IPO because it bought a part of Lyft. But General Motors didn't buy all of Lyft or a controlling stake of Lyft. It just bought a minority stake in Lyft. Well, that means... On General Motors' balance sheet, they have an equity investment. But on Lyft's balance sheet, they have a minority interest stake represented of General Motors' investment in them. It's a liability to the equity holders of General Motors that say, I owe you a piece of my profits. And so that's the point, is that if, if I have a partial stake in another business, then that minority stake to me is that I don't control, right? Is, and that's the other point. It's like I have a minority shareholder, not a common shareholder, but I have a sp very specific minority shareholder that has a special class of stock that I owe money to. Well, that's a minority shareholder. So at some point, I'm going to give them some money that's separate than my common shareholders, right? And I'm assuming that General Motors actually did this as a different class of stock. I'm pretty sure they did. All right, so let's just assume for this example that they did. So they get a separate class of stock, so therefore they get a separate investment. And that's a minority payment that's made. It's not a common distribution, it's just a minority payment. So the minority payment is a dividend to them. And that's the minority payment on the income statement. The actual amount that General Motors originally gave to Lyft is tracked on the balance sheet. And so if that ever changes, just like equity, then you change that just like equity. And any other payment that's made to them is tracked in the income statement. And those are the two things that you see reflected on company statements. So that's why there's two of them, just so you know. And so that's the point. This is a dividend. This is basically a payment to the minority shareholders. This would be change in the stake of the minority shareholders, just like if I bought back the stock of the minority shareholders, or if the minority shareholders gave me new money. So I track them both, and I have to account for them both. The other thing that I've done for tonight's class, and I'm just looking at the clock, is because I want to help you with your next week's assignment, is I put up a new PowerPoint. And I put it up into tonight's class in the file section, and it's under lecture notes, <clears throat> and it's called lecture to supplements. I put it up right before the class started. So if you can, download that file. And I will download it here very quickly as well. All right. What this supplement does is it has two statements. One is called an ROIC tree, and this is for McDonald's, and the other is called a CFI, cash flow available to investor statement, and this is also for McDonald's and for a company called Chipotle. So McDonald's and Chipotle. And by the way, this was going to be homework three. You were going to do this one on McDonald's. I'm switching homework three because I want to cover it in class to Starbucks. So as I said, if you did homework three, you're going to have to redo this part of homework three because it's no longer McDonald's. It's now Starbucks. And I'm going to cover homework three in class right now. So here's the point. 
of these two statements. So once you have converted, I'm gonna make them bigger. And so again, it'll be easier if you can actually have it in front of you. And again, this is this file, files. <clears throat> class, lecture notes, lecture two supplement. That's the file. So let's go back to Oh, it's another tab. All right. So here is the point. This is an ROIC tree. And it's based on EOI, which stands for end of year ROIC. When you did your homework assignment, it was based on beginning of year ROIC. End of year means current year no plat divided by current year invested capital, just for simplicity. So five years, this tree is five years. It's set up to be five years. So 2010, McDonald's ROIC, 21.8%. And I just want to focus on the beginning and the end for right now. In 2014, McDonald's ROIC was 18.9%. This is the five-year change. The five-year change was a decrease in ROIC of negative 13.6%. So said another way, McDonald's, and I'll use the annotation here so you can see where I'm pointing. McDonald's ROIC in 2010 was 21.8%. In 2014, it was 18.9%. It's a 13.6% drop in ROIC. For any company, there are three things that drive ROIC. It's just math. Okay? So what is driving ROIC? Basically, profit divided by sales. times sales divided by investment equals <clears throat> and because basically the S's cancel out profit divided by investment. That's just the formula for ROI. So what this formula tells us is three things are going to drive ROI. This is one. This is two. And taxes are three. So let's take out the taxes that McDonald's paid. In 2010, McDonald's tax rate was 29.3%. In 2014, McDonald's tax rate is 35.5%. That increase in taxes, 21%, did that hurt or help McDonald's ROIC? If you pay more taxes, does that raise your ROIC or does that lower your ROIC? Lower. Exactly. So we know one of the reasons why McDonald's ROIC went down is because the tax rate went from 29.3 to 35.5. Now, if we take out taxes, we're left with the pre-tax ROIC. That's that number. This is the business. In 2010, McDonald's selling burgers made 31%, 30.9% ROIC. In 2014, 29.2, a 5.4% drop. So we know McDonald's ROIC over this five years got worse. Well, why? Well, this goes to two and three. Driver one is the tax rate. Driver two is profit over sales. That's the operating margin. Driver three is productivity. That's the S over I. So these two things, this times this equals that. This times this is that. So these two things have equal weight. 
this, this, and this are the drivers of ROIC. That's why it's called a tree. So we're treeing it out. So if we look at the profitability, in 2010, when you bought a burger at McDonald's, they made 31% pre-tax margin. That's their operating margin. In 2014, selling the same burger, they made 29 cents. That's a 6.7% drop in margin. Did that help or hurt this ROIC? Hurt. Exactly. So they lost two cents of operating margin, which further hurt their ROIC. Now the third factor, a little tricky, because I inverted S over I to I over S. And the reason why I did that is because companies don't think in terms of I, companies think in terms of S. So let me be specific. When you guys are at work, basically, how much did you sell? How much money did you make? It's margin, right? When you think about investors, they say, how much money did I give you? And what did you give me back? I don't care what you sell. I look at return and investment. So the major difference between companies and investors is that companies tend to focus on sales and investors tend to focus on everything being denominated on investment. And what we know that connects the two together is this formula, sales over investments, productivity. Margin times productivity is return on investment. Margin times productivity is return on investment. So here's the point. I'm just, I took the reciprocal. This is the reciprocal of this. It's I over S because companies think in terms of sales. So let me give you this. In 2010, to sell a dollar of sales, McDonald's invested a dollar. So it needed to invest a dollar to sell a dollar. In 2014, to sell a dollar of sales, McDonald's invested 99 cents. Which one's better? Is 2010 better or is 2014 better? Investment divided by sales. 2014. Exactly. McDonald's got 1.4% more productive because it uses one cent less of cash, so 1.4 cents less of cash, to basically sell the same stuff. So if I think about the ROIC, McDonald's improved the productivity of its assets, but unfortunately it was offset by a decline in margin and a higher tax rate to lead to a lower ROIC. I want you to look at Chipotle. I'm gonna leave it on the screen for a minute. And I want you to look at these two numbers, 2010 and 2014. And I want you to look at these three drivers. And I want us to see if we can explain why this went from 26.6 to 40.8. So I'm gonna give you two minutes to look at Chipotle. And what you're trying to do is understand how those three things explained why Chipotle's ROIC went from 26.6 to 40.8, using those three things. And when you answer it, make sure you use numbers. All right, someone want to take a shot at this? Or at least part of this? So it looks like uh, Chipotle's return on invested capital um, increased at 53.3% from 2010 to 2014. Yep. And so when we look at the tax rates, um, their cash tax rate actually went down from 38.1 to 37.6. Um, meanwhile, their pre-tax ROIC grew 
52.2% in between then. And so looking further down, we see that they improved their margins in that five-year period while imp improving proficiency or uh, from invested capital to sales. <clears throat> Everything you said is absolutely right. In an ideal world, and for a grade next week, use numbers. So say, went from 15.7 to 17.3, went from 36.5 to 26.4. Okay. It's the only way that I can truly follow what you say. But otherwise, you're looking at it exactly right. Now let's think about magnitude. Which of those three? So all three are helping Chipotle. That was the case for McDonald's, by the way, during this period of time. And by the way, this is pre-E. coli Chipotle. Okay. So let's go back to Chipotle. <clears throat> Which of these three helped them the most? What do you think? I'd say the negative 27.5%. Uh, so the productivity, they got a lot more efficient with their restaurants. Which, by the way, this is when they were in hyper growth mode because they were opening up stores left and right. And usually that's a lot of eye, but their sales were going up faster than they could open up the stores because they'd open up the stores and boom, they had lines around the block. All right, they were like in and out burger. Okay? Couldn't really get in there at lunchtime. By the way, they're a ghost town today at lunchtime. Different story. But the point of the story is they were driving productivity. And you can see that in their numbers. They were driving sales much faster than investment was going up. At the same time, they were making better margins. So all three were working for them. Taxes had the least impact. And that's what I want you to understand. And by the way, think about this competitively, because it was during this period of time that Chipotle was increasing their margins, that McDonald's margins were falling. And while Chipotle was dramatically increasing its productivity, McDonald's productivity stuck in the mud. All right, taxes aside, Chipotle was getting much better. McDonald's was actually getting worse. And that's what we saw here with the two pre-tax ROICs. And that's what we're going to eventually compare and contrast once we now have it in this operating format. That's the first level of analysis for any company. Always talk about the tax rate, talk about the operating margin, talk about the invested capital sales. They each have equal weight in driving ROIC because of multiplication. All right, so those are the first three factors. Next, and I'm gonna call this the second level of analysis. We'll start with Chipotle. Gross margin minus SG&A minus depreciation equals operating margin. These are the three things off the income statement. This minus this minus this equals that. So these three things explain the operating margin. These three things off the balance sheet, working capital, PP&E, good one and tangibles, when you add them, sum to that. So for the second level of analysis, these three things explain the change in margin. These three things explain the change in productivity. Five years. So operating margin, 2010, 30.4%. 2014, 29.9%. Their operating margin actually went down, flat to slightly down. So it wasn't because they got better gross margins. Their SGNA went from 11 to 9.9. Well, there you go. That is a lot of the reason why the operating margin went up. They actually got better at SGNA. Depreciation went from 3.8 to 2.7. So better. Utilization of the assets depreciation, better spending on overhead, SGNA, led to better operating margins. The 11 to 9, 9, and the 3, 8 to 2, 7 drove the operating margins. Can I ask a question? Quick question. Yeah. So, going from, from 2010 to 2014, the third one, the depreciation, well, what, what does that mean? I mean, minus 28.4%. Oh, this is all as a percentage of sales. Everything on this ROIC tree is a percentage of sales. So it basically says, okay. if, I'm, if I think about a store, which I'm spreading out over 10 or 20 years, basically that, that yearly spending divided by sales is going down. So that suggests okay. everything here is a percentage of sales. Okay. Okay. So think about work. Now let's think about investing capital. Why are they using less capital? 
is so depreciation it, when you say utilization of assets isn't that depreciation essentially like isn't there a large discretion as to how that's applied i mean is that like a is that is there any utility in actually analyzing that because superficially i mean yeah, there's a lot of discretion on in how that's. I, I could go on a ten minute riff about my problems with accounting, but nonetheless, <laughs> gotta play the cards we're dealt. So, if nothing else, accounts put things into somewhat somewhat arbitrary buckets. Like, for example, I have a laptop. They tell me it's going to last three years. I've never kept a laptop for three years. Right, just in the nature of my business. So, so long story short, but I still spend it. Kept you know spread the cost out over three years. They say certain buildings are 20 years. So, so the point is they have these kind of semi-arbitrary rules, but the, if nothing else, for FASB gap statements, they're straight line. So for, for straight line depreciation with a half-year convention, they're spreading it out equally over time. So if I'm spreading out a fixed cost over time and sales change, then that's where productivity comes into play. So if I have a fixed amount of investment and my revenue is changing, then it's going to change depreciation. So the point is, if depreciation gotcha. is stable, but I'm spending the same amount as my sales grow. If gotcha. my depreciation as a percentage of sales goes down, that basically means sales are growing relative to depreciation. That suggests more productivity. And by the way, that's exactly what we're going to see in the balance sheet. So, great, thank you. Capital lowers better to sales. PPE lowers better to sales. Intangibles lowers better to sales. So, in 2010, a dollar of sales represented 36 cents of sorry. 36 cents of investment were needed to drive a dollar of sales. In 2014, 26 cents drove a dollar of sales. They spent less to sell the same stock. Productivity went up. First one's working capital. Now, Chipotle has negative working capital because they basically owe their suppliers a lot of money and they don't really have accounts receivable. So they went from having negative 1.6 cents of investment to negative one cent of investment which actually suggests that Chipotle is spending some money. Okay, I see company just chose Royal Caribbean. Thank you. The other three teams can quickly uh, put your stuff in the chat box, but we got one team that chose Royal Caribbean. So they're off the shelf. All right, so working capital actually got a little worse. It went less negative, which suggests more working capital. Somebody else should sit Nike, by the way. PPE is sales. 37 cents to 26.9. They're spending 10 cents less on their facilities. This is where the dramatic improvement came from. And Goodwill and Intangibles, they basically didn't do any acquisitions. So almost all the improvement in productivity is right here in PPD to sales, the 36.9 to 26.9. So if you really think about what drove their ROIC higher, the biggest factors were the store productivity, the PPD to sales, 369 to 26.9, and the SGNA and depreciation going down off the income statement, which drove their margin. We can see clear lines to the improvement in ROIC. All right. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to go to the CFI statement. I'm going to start with McDonald's. So the, the next question is how do we analyze a CFI? All right. So the short answer is the CFI has four sections, right? We just went through them in the conversions. Operating, which is free cash flow, non-operating, debt, equity. A CFI walkthrough walks through all four sections, right? You start with free cash flow. You'll see five years of CFI, and then I'll add a total column, which is literally the sum of the five years. So this is five years added up, and that's the one we're gonna analyze. And for your assignment next week, this is the one that I want you to focus on is the total for Starbucks, which will be the company you're gonna do next week, okay? So for this four year period for McDonald's, gross cash flow, 35.5 billion, 35.465, and gross investment, the 24, 226.7 before acquisitions led to free cash flow of 23.9. So you start here at the 23.9. So over five years, McDonald's made almost $24 billion worth of free cash flow. Because it's positive, 
the purpose of your analysis is where do they spend the money? Do they put it in the bank? Do they pay debt or do they pay equity? Because they had money, I know they did it. If this number were negative, then I'm gonna be looking in these three sections to find where the money came from. But that's basically how you start this. The other thing you look at is what's called the reinvestment rate. The reinvestment rate is the gross investment, what I'm putting in, divided by the gross cash flow, what I make. It's a percentage of the profits reinvested. Basically, McDonald's was reinvesting 31.7% of its profits, which means, 30, call it 32, 68% of its profits were available for payout. That's the 24 billion, okay? Now, what do they do with the 24 billion? If we think about the non-operating section, typically the big thing is here in cash, and what they did, negative 188 actually says they reduced their excess cash. They didn't increase the excess cash. They reduced the excess cash. And they spent a billion on non-operating assets. So they actually ended up with 24, or sorry, they got a billion by selling non-operating assets. So what they ended up with is 24,757 of cash available to distribute over a five-year period of time. Almost 25 billion available to distribute. Now, how did they do it? A billion seven was paid out in interest. We know that because that's a positive number. Negative 4.4 billion means they borrowed $4 billion more debt. Now, this was a midterm exam question I had asked previously, so I'll ask it here in class. Did McDonald's need to borrow that debt? Did McDonald's need to borrow $4 billion during this five-year period of time? Yes or no? No. No. How do we know? Positive free cash flow. Yeah, they had $24 billion of free cash flow and $25 billion of CFI. They clearly the tax have to field. borrow that debt. This is discretionary debt. So we're about to see why they didn't in a second. McDonald's then, that's the debt, we'll go section four, equity, paid 14 billion in dividends and bought back $13.6 billion of common stock from shareholders. I'm gonna round off. 14 plus 14 is how much? 28. If I have 25 to pay out, how do I actually pay out 28? You get debt. Borrow. That's exactly what they did. Is now, that for the tax shield? I don't blame them. We have all-time low interest rates in the corporate world, and bondholders are willing to give them money for next to nothing. Why not take advantage of that and use the proceeds to drive EPS, especially when your business isn't doing any better? You can't blame them for doing that. And they can clearly afford the debt because they made $25 billion of free cash flow. So nobody's worried about the debt actually being repaid at this point. So... I'm saying you can clearly see what they were doing over five years, right? Now, here's what's interesting. I'm gonna give you a rule of thumb. <clears throat> this goes back to what somebody mentioned about depreciation. Okay? <clears throat> what accountants do with depreciation with straight line is they basically say they're guessing the life of an asset. Now, let's just assume that the accounts are good at guessing life of an asset. So if I really believe something's gonna last 10 or 20 years, then I depreciate it over 10 or 20 years. At the end of 10 or 20 years, it's done. So the idea is, rule of thumb, to maintain that asset, I should reinvest my depreciation. So if 10% of my business is wearing out, then I should put 10% back in to replace the 10% that's wearing out. So if I'm stable, just waiting in a, waiting in a pool, I'm not swimming anywhere, I'm just staying in place, I should spend depreciation to maintain my business. If I'm growing, I should probably reinvest more than depreciation. If I'm shrinking, I would spend less than depreciation. Not saying it always works out, but just rule of thumb. So I want you to see the last three years of McDonald's. Look at 2013. Look at the depreciation, and then look at capital expenditures. Look at 12, 13, and 14. Tell me what you see.
the rate at which they reinvest is going down? One, it's going down. Compared to depreciation, tell me what that means. Look at 2014. Look at their depreciation, and then look at their capital expenditures. What do these two numbers tell you? Are they just not replacing anything? They're not. They're, they're absolutely not. In real dollar terms, they're not. To replace what's wearing out, they should spend a billion six. They spent 400 million. Why would they do that? They're not growing. Exactly. Hindsight's 2020. But I'm telling you, the headlines you saw in 2015 and 2016 about McDonald's having problems with same store sales, closing restaurants had to refigure out their menu, they knew. And they knew because they were already slowing down their expansion. It was showing up in their financials. I'm just telling you, hindsight is 2020 here. But that's the point. If you think through the rule of thumb, that's what I mean by rule of thumb, is that if I'm seeing a company that's spending capital expenditures two, three times its depreciation, they're probably in growth mode. If I see companies that are not spending their depreciation, they're probably not in growth mode. They're probably going to shrink. So in a way, it almost becomes predictive of the future. In fact, I correlate that with reinvestment rates. What's their reinvestment rate? Well, their reinvestment rate of 32% on average of five years, but it's been declining the last few. That's a signal that basically says growth in the future is going to be <coughs> So the other thing that CFI can do is it can be an early warning indicator for a directionality of a company. So very quickly, I'm just going to give you Chipotle, and I want you to tell me what we saw at Chipotle over this five years. Just look at the total. And if somebody wants to, in real time, almost try and walk through this, how would we analyze Chipotle's free cash flow? Or, or sorry, CFI, starting with free cash flow. What can we say about Chipotle? And again, use numbers. Well, we start here. So they had 900, almost 970 million, 968.9 million of free cash flow over the five years. Average reinvestment rate of 48%, higher than McDonald's. Because they generated 1.8 billion from the income statement, 900 reinvested the balance sheet, almost all of that was CapEx, very little working capital. They didn't do any acquisitions. Of the 968 million, they increased their cash by 436. So they basically took half the cash, approximately, more like 40 something percent, but they took almost half the cash they put in the bank. They also increased their non operating assets, whatever they are. So they only had 140 to distribute. No interest expense, and what little debt they had, they paid off. Clean balance sheet, no debt, 100% equity. They also bought back $630 million worth of stock. Think about this. How many growth companies in hyper growth mode are simultaneously buying back the stock and have enough cash to do it? These were like the ideal statements. That's why Chipotle stock price was on fire during this period of time, up until the point they tried to kill everybody with E. coli, right? And then bad things happen. But regardless, during this period of time, think about the tale of two companies here. Look at their depreciation. Look at their CapEx. What does that rule of thumb tell us? They were growing. They were spending more than they were. And, th and that's the point. Look at Chipotle, hyper growth, spending two and a half times their CapEx. They're predicting more growth in the future. McDonald's, bad times are ahead. Right here in the statements. 
So <clears throat> here's what's about to happen. So as I said, I'm changing today homework three. So for homework three, and this is the this is a tough assignment, but what you're going to do, I'll kind of go back here online and mention it. So in the assignments for homework three, it's really a two-part assignment. You're going to watch these one-hour long videos. There's two one-hour long videos. And in these videos, it's basically going to create a valuation of Starbucks as of last week. What you have to do is follow along. You'll, you'll start with a spreadsheet, and you'll basically build to Starbucks stock price last week. So you're just going to replicate what I do in the videos, and then <clears throat> you're going to basically, that's this part of the assignment, and then you're gonna put in some changes to growth, margin, productivity, and you're gonna come up with what you think Starbucks stock price should be. So essentially create a quick target stock price for Starbucks and explain why in a brief write-up. Then, and this is what switched, instead of McDonald's CFI and McDonald's ROIC tree, you're gonna analyze the actual real-time Starbucks CFI and ROIC. I'm uploading those tonight and you're gonna write up the analysis just like I walked through McDonald's and Chipotle. I recorded this class. I'm gonna post this as a YouTube link, which will be available shortly after this class, and that's what we're gonna discuss in class next week. Final thing that I need is I need, uh, you can't have Visa. Well, actually you can't have Visa. I'll let you do Visa, but Visa might be tricky. I'll warn you that Visa might be tricky. So I'll, I'd like to steer you away from Visa if you can go to somebody else, but you can have Visa. Um, so we, I want to finish up the, three, the four teams. So group four is going to be Nike. Group, what else do we have here? You can do a commodity. You can do like a, whatever the Dow DuPont or um, whoever, Halliburton. Sure, you do Halliburton. I think group three want to do CVS. Uh, CVS should be good. They would work well. So let's go to back to the uh, last part, people. Sir, Professor. Yes. Um, this is Kunaba from Team Two. We're going with Holly Button. Okay, so Team Two, I'll go ahead and I'm going to just add right here. Edit. So I'm going to call you Group Two. Group just so we all can keep track of who's doing what, myself included. You will do Halliburton. Yeah. Great. Uh, who else do we have? Team, just because I don't have the chat box in front of me. Team um, three. Team three is going to do who? CBS. Oh, sorry. I want to delete that. Edit. All right. Team three. Can we do CBS? Great. Well, team one, team one was uh, Royal Caribbean. Your Royal Caribbean. All that right. Is it two R's. Caribbean. All right. And finally, team four. Nike. 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 Great. I think those will work out well. So, um, for Nike. So here's what I'm going to do. For next week's class, uh, we're going to stay with Zoom. So I'll put a Zoom link into the, uh, the class. We're, we're staying away from Adobe Connect. I don't care what the MBA office says. They can come after me for that. But at least this worked as a class. Um, what we're going to do is basically I'm going to go through Bloomberg, and I'm going to get to the data that you need from Bloomberg for – like you had the EIC assignment last week with all that data, I'm going to get the screenshots for each of these companies and I'm going to get the data files to do the valuation for each of these companies. I'm going to start putting it into the file section of, of uh, here. So there'll be four and, and there'll be a folder called team projects or group projects and each of your companies will be in there and I'll start putting data in there. So by next week, you'll start having the data to do the analytics. So you'll have the data to do the uh, Nike EIC. You'll have the data to do the Nike ROIC tree and the CFI. 
and then you'll have the data to do the valuations. So I'll put the data in there, and that's what we'll also cover during next week's class. All right, so before we wrap up today, questions. I know we went through a lot. All right, one change. Next week, now that we have a stable platform, and I can actually see, for those of you that turned on your video, I need everybody to turn on their video in Zoom, um, we're gonna start the class by going through the analysis for Starbucks. Uh, I'm gonna start calling on people. I, I appreciate the volunteerism that we have, but I, I would like to get some more participation. So just be prepared to answer these questions, because I'm probably gonna call on you, and I'm gonna try and call on people who haven't spoken as much yet, because I, I do want to get a broader degree of participation from the class. But again, uh, before we wrap up, any other questions? All right, well again, look for the links to this class as well. I'll, I'll post the recording onto YouTube and the Starbucks assignment will be updated in minutes. Uh, that just is due before class starts next week. And again, if you want to see the solution to homework two, uh, we were on spring break this week. I'm back from spring break this weekend. So I'll make sure homework one and two are graded uh, very quickly now that I'm going to be back. So other than that, uh, have a good week, and I'll see everybody next week. Class is over. It's fine. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.